Uh, <clears throat> so this morning, uh, Saturday, May 2nd, uh, the real um, have a tea show and a bit of uh, talk too on Roshi Kaplow's uh, life. Uh, his death date would be May 6th. So we'd like to do this before uh, the actual death date. We'll have a little ceremony uh, at the after the tea show. Uh, of course, Roshi Kaplow underlies all that we do at the Zendo. Uh, Rose and I, most of you know, uh, became uh, very good friends with Roshi. Indeed, we were family. Uh, we traveled with him. We stayed with him. Uh, went to movies with him. He came to our house and would have dinner here. He'd use our hot tub. Uh, we'd watch movies together right here. Uh, he was a person who uh, we were very close. Uh, and uh, uh, we owe him uh, everything uh, uh, in terms of opening up the path of practice and of, uh, and of friendship, intimacy. I know other teachers uh, who came through him uh, had a very uh, professional, formal uh, relationships, uh, but our training with him really took place personally, intimately, and informally. Uh, we were his attendants uh, for many various events, both here and elsewhere. Uh, and in traveling and being with him and working with him in these ways, we imbibed uh, things that uh, changed us uh, in a variety of ways. So uh, I'd like to read to you, as I've done each year, uh, for those of you who've been around uh, a while, I'd like to read uh, to you. Um, a uh, piece that I wrote that Buddha Dharma asked me to write uh, uh, not long after Roshi Kaplow died as part of their memorial that appeared in uh, Buddha Dharma magazine. So uh, let's see if I can first of all call it up without creating any problems uh, for, uh, uh, for us. Uh, so hang on a sec and let me get the article. Um, okay. Uh, the article was titled A Pillar of Zen, uh, and it's now online through Lion's Roar. It's also online. You can read it at the Endless Path Zendo uh, 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 website. All right. So A Pillar of Zen, Roshi, Roshi Philip Kaplow, uh, nine, 1912 to 2004. It's very hard to believe that it was 16 years ago. Uh, I can't believe I'm that old, uh, first of all, but second of all, 16 years, my gosh. Uh, that's like uh, four college careers, and yet it seems just like yesterday. So uh, here's the piece. Um, uh, my Zen teacher, Roshi Philip Kaplow, died peacefully on May 6th at the venerable age of 91. Several days later, many of us who had known him and had been with him for more than 30 years gathered for his burial at the Chapin Mill Retreat Center, the country property of the Rochester Zen Center. Some who were there had since found other teachers and other teachings, or had simply taken other directions in life than the path of Zen. All of us, though, felt a deep gratitude and love uh, that no words can express. Each, each person there, uh, now there's a weird typo here, seemed, uh, that's the word, it looks like seed, but it should be seemed to find that at bottom they owed this man so much. He had opened the gate of practice and his immense love of the Dharma had saved us from deeply painful lives. Uh, the Three Pillars of Zen, the now classic work that brought him into the public eye and led him to found the first Zen center in America headed by a Westerner, was published in 1965 when the world was in chaos. Uh, the Vietnam War was still on. Most of us uh, at that time uh, were in our early 20s and to be honest, uh, we were somewhat crazed. Uh, we had just come through the 60s. Uh, most of us arrived 
well, I don't know about most of us, but many of us had arrived uh, before the 60s were over. Rose and I came uh, right in the middle of 1970. Uh, and uh, we had come through the 60s and uh, the Vietnam War was still on. The country was torn apart. We were torn apart. Uh, we were torn wide open. Anyway, he stood at an ancient door, held it wide open and said to us simply, come in, work hard. The Dharma will never let you down. He used to say that a great deal. If you don't let the Dharma down, the Dharma will never let you down. Uh, Roshi's dying and death occurred outdoors beneath the new leaf trees in the backyard of the Rochester Zen Center where some 30 years earlier, he and a cadre of quite unskilled laborers had built this center from a burnt out shell of a building. He liked to say in those early days, we specialize in burnt out buildings and people. Uh, by that he meant burnt out people. Spring had just come to the Northeast, so the birds sang and the sun shone down to where he sat in his wheelchair, uh, like the Buddha beneath the flowering solid trees. He wore his favorite chinos, flannel shirt, tan cloth sneakers, and sunglasses, and was surrounded by friends, some from Rochester, others who had flown in to be with him. Uh, my ex Rose was there with him. Uh, I got off a plane coming from, where was it? Reno, <laughs> coming from a conference I'd been speaking at in Reno, Nevada. And I got off the plane and an old friend, old Dharma friend, Jay Thompson, picked me up at the airport and said, Roshi has just died. I'm taking you there. And Jay brought me to the center and Roshi was still there surrounded by friends uh, and he had passed away. Uh, he had actually been living with Parkinson's the last 13 years uh, leading up to this, living admirably actually, but getting weaker and weaker, especially this last year. And the last few days, he'd also had pneumonia. Uh, it was time to go. His mind had remained clear, and he still loved jokes, though even his favorite movies, uh, which we used to watch with him quite a lot, often here at our house, uh, Mel Brooks's To Be or Not To Be, a, a very non-cynical uh, Mel Brooks movie, uh, quite a moving one, quite compassionate, uh, a really touching and funny story, to be or not to be, about a uh, theater troupe in Poland when the Nazis come in and uh, Mel Brooks has to uh, play the role of Hitler uh, to get them out. Uh, if you've never seen it, uh, this might be a good week in memorial of Roshi Kaplow uh, to watch Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft in To Be or Not To Be. He also loved Ninochka and Fiddler on the Roof. But uh, Fiddler on the Roof, um, all these movies following the narrative had become kind of hard for him. And especially Fiddler on the Roof, he would only watch the first half as the second half had become just much too sad for him. And he just couldn't bear it. Each scene was compelling for him, but putting the narrative together, as I said, had gotten tricky. He still loved to laugh and to be read to everything from koans and koan commentaries, poetry, history, politics, news, and science, to The Cat Who Went to Heaven, one of his favorites, uh, which was uh, the 1929 Newbery Award winner by Elizabeth Coatsworth and illustrated by Lynn Ward, one of the great illustrators. Uh, it's a great little story and it, one of the books that introduced me to the Jatakas, actually. It's about a Japanese painter who has a cat who's painting a picture of the Buddha's body Nirvana. And it, though it's a children's book, it's a wonderful story. If you don't know it, I still recommend it highly. And he also, I would read to him, Horton Hatches the Egg, which he pronounced a great Zen tale, one that all Zen students should read. And if you don't know Horton Hatches the Egg, it should be, it should be, it should be like that. Because Horton, Horton was faithful. He sat and he sat. Uh, Zen students, uh, I hope your ears perked up with that. He sat and he sat. And if you don't know Horton Hatches the Egg by Dr. Seuss, Seuss, 
uh, Zeus, uh, please go out and read a copy, get a copy and read it. Uh, it's an important book, as Roshi Kaplow said. Slowly, slowly his far off Dharma friends called and the phone was held to his ear to receive their well wishes and farewells. He drifted further away. His eyes had closed earlier and now as death approached, his breathing simply became fainter and shallower. The passage between life and death was so subtle and gentle, it was hard to pinpoint when death actually occurred. An exhale, another, then he was off between breaths and worlds. And of course, I wasn't there for those moments. So that came from talking with Rose and Sumyana Roshi and others. Friends sat with him still whispering into his ear, holding his hand, and there was chanting, the Prajna Paramita, the Shosamyo, and the Kanzeon, which we'll be doing in the little service we hold for him after the Tesha and uh, another little reading. That night, the local Zen community and many longtime friends gathered in the Zendo. Two of his closest friends and students, Sinyana Graf Sensei at the time, Roshi now, and Rose Martin, our Rose Martin, had washed his body and clothed him in his Roksu and robes, and now he lay in an open casket before the altar. Over the next few days, his unembalmed body would show no signs of either rig unembalmed body uh, showed no signs of rigor or decomposition. He was buried, not cremated, by his own choice. When the notion was presented to him, he concurred that the decision for burial was not simply a personal preference, but a Dharma teaching. Form and essence or essential nature are not two. To burn the form would suggest that they are somehow separate. He would not accept that as an answer in Doksan. He did not embody it as a teaching now. Perhaps he was also saying that as Westerners and Buddhists, we need not take on Eastern cultural forms. Our grandparents and parents were all buried. To be Buddhist need not mean we become anything other than what we already are. Let the natural processes proceed and the body decompose as the bodies of our ancestors and forebears had been allowed to do in their time. There is nothing to add to what we already are and nothing special to do. Philip Kaplow was born in 1912 to a working class family in New Haven, Connecticut. According to the Rochester Zen Center's obituary, as a young man, he studied law and became a court reporter, serving for many years in the state and federal courts of Connecticut. He recorded trials of increasing importance and was selected in 1945 to serve as chief court reporter for the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. He later covered the Tokyo war crimes trials. His karma was unfolding, for in that unique position, he took down testimony and became a witness to the greatest horrors, not only of this last century, but perhaps of any. It was that horrifying experience that brought him to Zen. He used to say that two things about Japan affected him deeply. The first was that the Japanese he met, unlike the Germans, were immediately willing to accept that their own sufferings had been caused by the suffering they had inflicted on others. It is our self-created karma, he was told. And he was deeply moved by the great peace and stillness he experienced walking beneath the beautiful trees at many of the Zen temples he visited while in Japan for the trials. He first took up Zen by reading voraciously in the literature available at the time, and by going to lectures and courses given by D.T. Suzuki at Columbia University. Beside writers, artists, musicians like John Cage and psychologists, there he sat, an American businessman, owner of a successful court reporter, reporting firm. Eventually, finding Zen philosophy by itself of little use in solving the great malaise he felt after the war. In 1953, he sold his court reporting business and returned to Japan to enter a Zen monastery and actually train in Zen, which he would do there in Japan for 13 years. Early on, So and Nakagawa Roshi became his friend. They called themselves the two hobos, and it was So and Nakagawa, brilliant, poetic, eccentric, 
who first took him under his wing, <clears throat> helped him find an entrance into the world of practice, and eventually introduced him to Harada Roshi, stern abbot of Hoshinji, saying he will be a much better teacher for you, Kaplo-san. Roshi Kaplo used to say that it had been for that initial generous and warm friendship with Nakagawa Roshi, the talks and travels, the hours they spent listening to recordings of Beethoven together. He might never have been able to stay in Japan or enter Zen at all. After three years of exhausting, miserable work under Harada Roshi, the great taskmaster of enlightenment, he continued his ongoing training as a layman with Yasutani Roshi. In the more relaxed atmosphere of that dedicated community of lay practitioners, he flourished. He got Kensho. He married, had a child, and in 1965 was ordained as a Zen priest and sanctioned to begin teaching in the Harada Yasutani line of Zen, which was to become so important and influential in the West. That, of course, is our line of Zen through Kaplan Roshi and as well as through uh, Robert Aitken Roshi. While practicing under Yasutani Roshi, he put his writing and court reporter skills to work transcribing Zen teachers' talks interviewing Zen lay students and monks, and recording the practical details of Zen Buddhist practice. He was the first Westerner allowed to observe and record Doksan. The resulting book, The Three Pillars of Zen, was published in 1965 and quickly became the standard introductory text on Zen practice. It is still in print, has been translated into 12 languages, the story of the American ex-businessman in the Three Pillars of Zen is Roshi Kaplow's own Enlightenment account, and it is still a corker, resonant and stirring and deep. It tells you better than any remembrance why people flocked to the center he established in Rochester. Indeed, over the years, that one book opened wide the floodgate of practice for thousands of Western Zen students at centers throughout North and South America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, and is still a living work today. Two of the earliest readers of the Three Pillars were Ralph Chapin of Chapin Manufacturing in Batavia, New York, and Doris Carlson of Rochester, the wife of, wife of Chester Carlson, the inventor of xerography, the technology that became the foundation for the Xerox Corporation. During his book tour in 1965, Doris Carlson invited Roshi to visit her small meditation group. Then in June 66, with the support of the Carlsons, he founded the Rochester Zen Center. These were not naive, starry-eyed seekers, but solid, mature, and steady people. Perhaps they saw in Roshi what my father saw. When I told my father, uh, then 86 himself, that Roshi had died, uh, he said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. He was so down to earth, so kind, and always such a gentleman. He was. Though he could also be tough as nails, sometimes when you did not want him to be, and sprout horns and fangs, to reveal in Zen parlance the black piercing eyes of a devil. He could also be a sweet and gentle and subtle and sensitive and wonderfully able to bless with his presence as a spring breeze after harshest winter. He had his particular failings and shortcomings. Sometimes his maverick strength, that firm unyielding jaw and solid chin were perfectly made were stubbornly sticking out into the wind, was at the same time that strength his greatest weakness. But given time and opportunity, he would invariably confess sorrow about his failures. We all do stupid things sometimes, is what he told a Dharma friend, and by that he meant himself, that he did stupid things and that he regretted them. Once he had a turkey brought into the Buddha hall at Thanksgiving, it had been purchased by the Zen Center to be released. And sure enough, uh, oh, 
but now the bewildered bird flapped about anxiously. Roshi got us all chanting, and sure enough, the frightened bird grew calm. Then Roshi put his hands together and bowed deeply to the turkey in Gasho, saying, Turkey bows to turkey. He meant it. He had a knack for making waves. His style was to call a spade a damn shovel. He broke with his own teacher, Yasutani Roshi, as he said in Zen merging of East and West because of differences over the personalizing and Westernizing of Japanese Zen. Years later, after Yasutani Roshi's death, he said with the greatest humility and sorrow, if my old teacher should walk into this room now, I would get down on my knees before him and beg for his forgiveness. He could be mischievous, direct, and down to earth. I remember after having dinner at his local, favorite local Chinese restaurant, uh, which was the Shanghai, which is, uh, we used to go there with him and we'd say, uh, we'd call ahead and say, the master is bringing X number of people for dinner. And uh, they would make all kinds of real Chinese dishes that were not on the menu. Uh, he had a very special relationship with the people there. I think it's now been plowed down and is a uh, car wash. Uh, the Shanghai is long gone. Anyway, we had dinner there and then we had a choice. We could go to a crowded, crowded upscale event and opening at the museum, or we could head back to our house, uh, Rose and mine, with Roshi, just the three of us, and watch Casablanca together again, as we often did. We looked at each other. Let's watch the movie, he exclaimed. And we did, repeating joyfully in unison, play it again, Sam. He often chose intimacy over a crowd and easy friendship on familiar grounds over a social dress up affair. But he was no recluse. He also could love crowds, throwing himself into conversation and social world with such childlike abandon that he only stopped when someone noticed he was near collapse with exhaustion from talking and would drag him away. He would have loved his own funeral services and his burial. They provided the very combination of pageantry, ceremony, community, and socializing he so enjoyed. He had a committed sweet tooth, so chocolate bars were put in his coffin along with small Buddhas, a leaf from the Bodhi tree, a long life pill, uh, which is a Tibetan thing, a pr practitioner I received from a Tibetan Lama, and a harmonica. He loved to play the harmonica and had a number of old favorites like Home on the Range and Old Lang Syne, with which he turned Sangha get-togethers into wonderful sing-alongs. For many years, the Japanese bath was one of his greatest joys, and he always had one in his quarters or nearby. Later, he made it a practice to come to our house, where he liked to stretch out in our bigger Japanese-style wooden tub, relax in very hot water, a metaphor for his life, when you think about it, and look up through the skylight in our bathroom over the tub into the trees. I also learned from a Dharma sister that he used to sometimes dance alone in his quarters when no one was around. She found this out when bringing him his afternoon tea. She would open the door and there he might be, silently dancing to a beat all his own. A great lover of animals, he dedicated his book on vegetarianism to cherish all life in inimitable Roshi Kaplow fashion to Elsie, Porky, and Donald. His Zen was clearly very Western and was from inside the culture, not an add-on. And if you don't know who Elsie, Porky, and Donald were, uh, email me and I'll give you some clues. He traveled to the Galapagos, that rough Eden, to see animals up close who had no ingrained fear of humans. He enjoyed spending time in rural Mexico where he'd walk down the lanes, dirt lanes, and see horses and cows wandering about on their own going their own ways, and where he could go out to and stand by the wire fence and talk with the great black bull, Negrito, who lived in the field nearby. Uh, I know this, Rose and I know this personally because we stayed with him 
we lived with him for a week or two in Mexico and uh, outside Tepoztlan. And we'd go walking with him and this is what he'd do. He'd walk along and he'd, and animals were just walking along on their own, the way dogs and cats, well, dogs used to walk along in the States, not anymore, but cats do. But it would be a horse or a cow walking along. And uh, Dane and Roshi told me that when he stayed with him down there, uh, Roshi Kaplow had a walking stick he always walked with when he was down there. He'd stop, he'd lean on his stick, he'd look at these chickens uh, walking around in the dirt and in the, uh, along the yards there and along the dirt lanes. And he'd stand and he'd just look at these chickens and he'd say, Danan, have you ever seen anything so amazing? He was such an unusual man for his generation. While he could be devastatingly logical and had a sharp mind honed to a fine edge for literal detail, uh, especially given his court reporting background, when speaking about myths and legends, especially those of the Buddha, he would say with the deepest kind of quiet respect, myth is truer than mere fact can say. Myth is truer than mere fact can say. And he also never referred um, to Buddha figures as Buddha figures or statues. He always said the Buddha on the altar. He never would literalize them. To him, each of those was a Buddha. He was a vivid storyteller who regaled us with tale after tale about his training days in Japan and his times with Nakagawa Roshi, Harada Roshi, and Yasutani Roshi, about the military war trials, and about his own travels in Asia as well. The history of Zen in the 20th century was in his blood, breath, and bones. One of his favorite stories from his own experience of Zen training involved the time he and an American philosophy professor were called from the Zendo one night at an early seshin in Japan. Dutifully, they appeared before the Roshi, glad to have an official reason to get up off that mat and straighten their aching legs. What did Christ say, on, say when he hung on the cross? Asked the Roshi. They looked at each quizzically, each other quizzically. The professor said, uh, my God, my God, wasn't that it? Why hast thou forsaken me? Yes, Philip Kaplow concurred. That's right, yes, that's right. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? No, said the Roshi. This went on back and forth several times. The two Westerners more and more sure they had gotten it right. The Roshi always disagreeing. At last, the Roshi burst out the words surging up directly from his hara with stunning force. What he said was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When Roshi Kapla would tell that story at night during Seshin, a gale of spirit would sweep through the Zendo, sweeping everything but pure yearning, aspiration and determination away. Uh, you had to be there. In countless ways, from the vividly dramatic to those that were simple, quiet, and almost beneath the radar, below the radar, he taught me and so many, many others how to place our feet on the path. He also taught me, in particular, and with an equal ardor, ardor where to put my commas. I knew how to make a sentence that had rhythm. He appreciated that but he saw to that I knew little or nothing of punctuation. I broke a sentence mostly, mostly of my breath. I was a storyteller and I wrote my sentences the way I spoke them. He loathed that and gave me hell for it. He taught me to place commas grammatically, uh, which reminds me, one of the first times I met him more than 30 years ago, well now more than 45 years ago, 40 years ago, he pointed out that in pulling up in my car to speak to him, I had parked too far from the curb. The implication, which he did not state directly, 
was that if I stayed where I was, the way I'd parked would make it difficult for others to pass. In other words, I had been thoughtless of the needs of others. I reparked and was more careful about such things in many areas of my life after that. He showed me that even the most seemingly inconsequential things I might do had consequences. He changed my life both in large, like that vast, and small ways. Given his many books, his teaching, both of the formal variety as in Doksan, Teisho, and Seshin, as well as through the informality of daily interactions and conduct, he affected untold lives. Though he is gone, his commitment to the endless fulfillment of bodhisattva vows guarantees that he will be back. Where and in what form, old friend, shall we meet again? So uh, that is the article, a Pillar of Zen, with some additional interpolations and uh, comments. Uh, do you have a, a piece you were going to read? Okay. So Rose is going to replace me in front of the uh, the uh, screen, and uh, she will read a piece that she's just written for Sinyana Roshi at the Vermont Zen Center for their ceremonies uh, this tomorrow. tomorrow this Sunday, uh, about her uh, personal connection with Roshi Kaplow. Uh, so you can hear that as well. So I will move over. Excuse me one sec. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so my teacher, Sanyana Roshi, asked several of her students who had at one time been Roshi Kaplow's uh, students also um, to write a very brief, uh, no more than 500 words, um, description of their experience as uh, training with Roshi. So uh, especially since uh, most of you won't be at that um, sitting tomorrow, I thought I would share it with you as well. Um, it's Life with Roshi Philip Kaplow, Teachings Outside Words and Letters. My Zen training with Roshi Kaplow was different from the very beginning. Most people who came to Rochester in the late 60s, early 70s, were unmarried and had no children, so they just threw themselves completely into formal Zen training. They lived at or very near the center and went to all the morning and evening sittings and attended every Sashin, Doksan, and Teisho that was offered. Out in public, you could tell who they were because they always looked down when they were walking on the street and hardly ever spoke. I, on the other hand, came to the Zen Center with a husband and an eight-week-old child viewed by others as my karmic impediment. So my initial formal training at the center was extremely limited, very few formal sittings and very limited doksan. We had lived in Rochester for a year and a half before I attended my first sushin. But slowly, inexplicably really over time like a vessel filling drop by drop a relationship developed outside the boundaries of formal zen training my zen training took place in countless intimate moments with roshi going for walks in our neighborhood having him over to our house for sunday night movies and thanksgiving dinners spending weeks being his guests in tepatslan in santa fe in Hollywood, Florida, wherever he might be living at the time, taking him shopping for clothes, watching how he tied his shoes, how he zipped his jacket, and how he accepted fully the circumstances of his Parkinson's disease. And when he returned to Rochester in his last years, having sushi lunch every Thursday, and finally keeping vigil at his side when he was dying, as a stream of people came to pay their respects. My Zen training took place in countless intimate moments. 
Looking back, it seems I was always meant to practice in this way with him. I first met Roshi in Binghamton in 1969 and received my first Zen teaching from him at that time. The philosophy department at Harper College, with the help of Jonathan Sheldon, arranged for Roshi to come and give an evening workshop, followed by a morning sitting. And he did a lot of that um, back in the early days. He would travel around and uh, give evening workshops and then the next day have a, a formal sitting for everyone to experience Zazen. Um, after the sitting, there was a lunch for Roshi with some of us who had worked on the event. We were sitting at the table, eating our meal in awkward Buddha-like silence, thinking, I'm sure, that this is how a fully enlightened person is supposed to act. We were all pretty self-conscious. I was sitting right across from Roshi. At one point, he took a bite of some homemade bread that had been no donated for the meal and exclaimed, this bread is delicious. That was his first and still very present teaching to me. Over time, I was able to learn from my teacher how to live, as he was fond of saying, an ordinary life in an extraordinary way. I'm still learning. I'm grateful to Roshi for setting my feet firmly on the path. Uh, Thanks, did you want to, oh, yeah, I think sure. I have, we have time. I have a little piece about traveling with him that no one's heard yet. So, okay. and then we'll do the service. Okay. Yeah. The service. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, when you, I know it's been a while. We've been shut down uh, with the uh, sheltering in place, but uh, here in Nizendo, the uh, ox uh, on the uh, Manjushri altar the uh, reclining bodhisattva in the doksan room, uh, the ox herding painting over the water table, were all gifts uh, from Roshi Kaplow uh, to Rose and myself uh, over the years. Uh, so there are literal things from him in the Zendo as well. Uh, this little piece I'm gonna read to you probably takes about five minutes or less. Uh, and then, uh, uh, if I can find it. And then we will uh, turn the uh, computer uh, screen around so you can see the picture of Roshi and the altar, and we'll do a little service uh, in his honor and memory. Uh, uh. So uh, the story goes, uh, we were in Hollywood, Florida uh, to stay for a few days with Roshi Kaplow. Uh, he was in his early 80s then. Uh, uh, and uh, you don't have to get into all the background because you've already kind of covered that and say a little bit about that here. Anyway, what to do on this, and he was already suffering from Parkinson's at the time. Uh, and so there we were staying with him in his little house in, in Hollywood, Florida. And what to do on this bright, hot February, Florida day. We decided uh, we'd go to Butterfly World. So we drove off and soon we were walking among displays of chrysalis and newborn butterflies and trees and lush plants, butterflies fluttering all around us as we walked. Uh, when Roshi got tired, we sat on a bench and uh, I launched ever the tour guide into a speech. Look how fragile these butterflies are. Their wing scales rub off at a touch. We, we had learned all this while we were walking around at Butterfly World. So I was summing it up. They have no obvious muscles, yet monarch butterflies fly thousands of miles in migration. It's migrations that take two generations. One generation picking up where the last left off to complete their journey. How do they know how to do that? Like us all, maybe. Heading towards something, toward, well, what the sutras call Buddhahood. Working out our sorrows generation by generation. And think of Sashin. We go into Sashin. Uh, means, of course, to touch the mind, like a caterpillar entering chrysalis, which in Greek is psyche. Uh, chrysalis is psyche uh, and means literally butterfly. Uh, it, like a, a, a caterpillar entering chrysalis uh, threaded with gold. Literally, the chrysalis has gold threaded in it, uh, which they produce, the caterpillar. 
we too are melted down and come out not just better caterpillars, but something new. Caterpillars melt in chrysalis. Every cell is melted down and rearranged, transformed. The new creature, a butterfly, has to break out of the old constrictive cocoon, pump its soft crumpled wings out to full size with ichor from the heart. The heart literally forms the wings and then it can soar. The literal structures of this world and those of the imagination, the inner life, are identical, I proclaimed. They repeat and reflect each other. Roshi Kaplow looked at me calmly, not taken in at all. Oh, that's just how you think, he replied. Does anyone else think that way? Who thinks like that? Say, would you do us a favor? He called to a young butterfly park ranger. She came over. Tell her, he said, tell her what you said about the imagination and life. So there he is, he just calls over a park ranger and has, wants me to go through the whole spiel again. Uh, so dutifully, but a bit more self-consciously now, I once more describe how the butterfly must go within, die, if you will, and then return to the world. How this is the shape of our lives, the hard work of each life, emerging from the cocoon of, our, of its past, rather. How I had always thought of butterflies as flitting, delicate, bright, gay creatures, but the realities of their transformation and perseverance are pitiless, pitiless, and unyielding as iron. Roshi, Roshi Kaplow watched the park ranger's face as I spoke. Then when I was done, he said to her, does that make any sense to you? She looked at us and said, it is the story of my life, and proceeded to tell of going to Turkey, where she met her future husband. As a young man, she said, he had known he was to live in America. How did he know? She shrugged. It was a mystery, without logical explanation, she said. He just knew. He spoke no English, so he went up into a cave in the mountains and lived there for three years and taught himself from a book. Then he reemerged from isolation, came back down the mountain, where they soon met and eventually married. So you see, she concluded, I believe this is true, what you say. Roshi looked at her. He looked at me and at the butterflies flapping and gliding and perching on the flowers around us. Thank you, he said. We got up, shook Kim's hand, that was her name, laughed and laughed and left. It is the story of our life. So we'll stop here and do our little ceremony uh, for Roshi Kapoor. We'll turn this around so you can see his picture on the altar, which he signed to us as to Rafe and Rose, my dear friends and companions. So uh, for this service, we'll be chanting the Prajna Paramita one time, the Kanzeon and the so Sho Sainyo each three times, and then there'll be a return of merit, and then we'll recite the memorial prayer together three times, um, chant the ancestral line, and then there'll be a special return of merit, ten directions, and great vows for all. I'm going to stop the recording at this point. Excuse me one second.